what a, what a wonderful day to be in the house of God. Can you say amen to that? I love being together with God's people. I love being in church. There's no place I would rather be. Man, it's just so great. And it's good to see all of you today. You know, um, just before we, go any, before we go further, I'd like for us just for a moment um, to pause. Uh, my heart's heavy today for what's going on in the Middle East. I don't know about you, just following it a bit in the news, and um, it's tragic. Lives are being lost, and there's uh, the enemy is at work. The enemy is at work. I was thinking about Paul's message even uh, last week. If you didn't hear Pastor Paul speak last week, you need to get his message last week. And how Satan, Satan is attacking. Satan is, he's not only just attacking us personally and causing distraction, but he is, he is alive and well in the world. And he is, he is controlling nations right now. And there is evil, there is evil being done to people. And uh, I'd like to just, just, wait, can we do it just, just a, maybe a moment of silence as you just kind of pray into this. Would you just take a couple of seconds? Father God, there's so many things we don't understand in this world that's going on. We do acknowledge the fact that the enemy of this world, the accuser, Satan is at work, and he is deceiving and lying. And people are your creation, people, beautiful, wonderful people being destroyed in the path of what the enemy is doing. We just bind it the devil right now. We bind you, Satan, in Jesus' name. We bind you, Satan, in the work that you're doing. We cast you right back into the pit of hell where you, do, where you belong. Cast you back in the pit of the hell where you belong. We pray, Jesus, and your purpose be glorified across this earth. We love you today, and Father, we pray that you would bring peace. Bring peace to Israel. Bring, bring peace to Jerusalem. Bring, bring peace to a people, Father God, that has been in turmoil for years and years and years and years. We pray it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. We need to be praying. Would you continue to be praying? Not, don't be overwhelmed with it. Don't let it, don't let it cause you to fear. Don't let it bring anxiety um, to, your, to your heart, to your life. But pray into it. Pray into it. Will you do that? Make it a, a, a top priority of your list of prayer. So I want to just, I want to lean into um, a passage of scripture here just as I get started. A psalm just before you're seated. I want to read this psalm. Psalm 139, verse 1 to 10. I want to talk to you about purpose today. Purpose, all right? Are you ready for that? Purpose. And I want you to just listen to the words of Psalm 139. I'm going to read it for you. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. And you're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. You know us, Lord. 
You know us inside and out. You know our thoughts. You know our thoughts. Before a word comes out of my mouth, you even know it. You know it. Your hand is upon each and every one of us this morning. And Lord, may the next few minutes be revelation of truth to our hearts and minds. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, let it be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. What a presence in this place. Do you sense it? Man, I do. A sense that God is at work and uh, man, it's great. I just love being in church together. I'm a church guy, always have been. I want to tell you this today. God is, has a specific purpose for you. I want you to hear that. God has a specific purpose for you. His general purpose is for you to know him and to be known by him. You have searched me, God, and you know me, the psalmist said. To know him and to be known by him. But God has a plan. He has a purpose for you. For you. There's some truths that I have learned. I want to just share them with you briefly. Truths that I have learned. Purpose in life is more important than property or possessions. Purpose in life is more important than property or possessions. Another truth I have learned, having more to live with is no substitute for having more to live for. Having more to live with is no substitute than having more to live for. Purpose. And the two greatest days of your life The two greatest days of your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. Now, all of you in this room, you've had the first day. (laughs) Thank God you're here. Look to your neighbors and say, I'm so glad you were born. (laughs) I want to tell you a story today. It comes from one of my very favorite books. It's one of my favorite Bible stories, but it comes from the book of Esther. I want to tell you the story of Esther today. The Bible is divided into eight sections, 66 books, eight sections, and Esther is located in the books of history. It's the second section. Joshua to Esther are the books of history. The author of Esther is unknown, but some attribute it to Mordecai. Mordecai is Esther's adopted uncle father. Mordecai, who not only lived the story, but had access to official court records and recorded this event shortly after it happened as a historical moment in Jewish history. Esther is part of a larger narrative that runs from Abraham to Christ and through Christ to the church that we know and love today. If Esther, a young, beautiful Jewish girl, had not embraced her life's purpose in the face of a life-threatening situation, there would be no salvation, no gospel message, and no Christian church as we know it today. This is a daring story of courage, a story of adventure, a story of obedience. It is a Cinderella story, a story of a young woman who goes from rags to riches. And I want to encourage you today. I want to encourage you to find your God-given purpose Your God-given purpose, you have a God-given purpose. It is important that you embrace the talents and skills that God has given you currently or has given you the interest to develop. Embrace what God is doing in your life and he wants to do. Embrace it. And by embrace, I mean develop some grit. Develop some grit. 
Develop some perseverance. And most importantly, develop some long suffering. Dr. Kent Engel, a friend of mine, he's the president of Southeastern University, which, by the way, is the university we have partnered with at our college here. It's a great university, yeah. Woo-hoo. It's the second, I don't know if you knew this, it is the second fast, according to the Chronicle of Education right now, it just came out, second fastest uni- growing university, second fastest growing university in the country. It is, it's just going crazy, and Kent is a, a fabulous leader. But he was asked, why partner with the local church? Why do this? Why, why a university that is growing so fast, why do you partner with the local church? And he said this, the local church is where you find out who you are created to be and designed to be. You can't move forward in your future until you know who you are in Christ. And that happens here. Happens here. If you have acknowledged Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you are in Christ. In Christ. In. In. As in under his covering of grace. In. You are in. You're covered by the grace. Thank God for the grace. Amen? You're in. You're covered. In. As in as in line. As in in line with the teaching of Jesus. You're in line with what the Bible says, with the truth of God's word. You're in, in line. You are in as in you have been adopted into a family of believers. Adopted, in. You are in. Second Corinthians chapter five. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. And the new is here. If you don't know your identity in Christ, it will affect everything you do in the future. Giving my life to Christ changed the course of my life. It changed everything. It changed everything for me. Everything. I remember as a, my, probably one of my youngest memories growing up, five years old. I grew up in a preacher's home. And when I was growing up, my dad wore a suit to church. That was the days when suits were worn to church and pastors wore suits to church and ties. I'm kind of glad those days are gone. (laughs) But I remember at five years old, I got a suit like my dad. And I remember a day that my dad walked out of his bedroom. He was heading to church. We were getting ready for church. A Sunday morning, my dad walked out of the bedroom and he had his suit and tie on. And man, he was, he was larger than life to me. I knew exactly what he was getting ready to do. He was going to preach. He had a mission that morning. He was going to preach. I went and got my little suit on, five years old. I went and got my suit on. I walked out the back sliding, do, sliding door back into the back patio. I climbed up onto our picnic table that sat on our back little patio, cement patio on the back. I got my preaching finger out because my dad preached with his finger. He modeled his life after the early days of Billy Graham. And I began to preach at the dog, and I began to preach at, we had rabbits in our backyard. I began, whatever, th- anything that moved and didn't move, it got saved that day. My five-year-old suit. A few years went by, and I graduated from high school. I don't know if you remember this at high school graduation, but they would vote. They would vote on, like, most likely to succeed. Remember that? Anybody? Most likely to succeed. Most likely to become president. You know, most likely to be a professional athlete. That certainly wasn't me most likely to be a millionaire, most likely to win a Nobel Prize. My year of graduation, they added one. They had never done it before. Kind of shocked me. Most likely to become a priest. (laughs) They were just a little off. There's a key verse in Esther chapter four, verse 14. 
For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. This story opens with King Ahasuerus, or Xerxes, which is known, his name is in the Greek. He's giving a seven-day party, and in his drunken condition, the king tells his queen, Queen Vashti, to display her beauty for everyone to enjoy. The queen refuses the king's invitation for reasons we don't necessarily know. Some scholars believe that she might have been pregnant at the time, but we don't know for sure why she said no to the king. Perhaps it would have been the same as if my wife, as if I asked my wife to today, today to come and display her beauty for you all to see. She's shaking her head right now at me, because her response would have said, do I know you? You look like my husband, you sound like my husband, but that just ain't going to happen today. Am I right? Yes. Yes, I am right today. My wife would respond, have you lost your mind? But the king flies into a rage. This is a king who demands absolute power. Nobody says no to the king. He commanded the largest army that had ever marched onto the field of battle in the ancient world. He ruled over 127 provinces. That at the age of of 35, he had inherited the largest massive empire the world had known up to that time. Think modern day Iran, Iraq, Ethiopia, Egypt, and most parts of India. This was a massive, massive empire. The king requires, uh, inquires with his guests about what should be done because his queen had refused his invitation and the men of the kingdom suggest that the situation must be dealt with immediately because it would cause a feminist rebellion and all the men would have difficulty within their homes and marriages. This rebellion must be stopped immediately to keep the men of the empire from losing their masculine supremacy. And Vashti, the queen, was immediately dethroned and dismissed. There was to be a search for another queen to replace Vashti, and the word went out to bring the most beautiful young girls before the king for him to choose a queen. And this is where Esther comes into the picture. Because of her beauty, her cousin Mordecai sends her into the group to be considered as queen. Esther was not born a princess, She was a member of a conquered race. Esther was an orphan. She was adopted by her cousin Mordecai as his daughter. And so they introduced Esther to beauty preparations as she was chosen, as she was selected. Beauty preparations that lasted a year. A year. Now, I love it, honestly, when Brenda gets her hair done. Wonderful. I love it. I see the bill. (laughs) And then I see her. And I'm, worth it. You're amazing. Or she gets her nails done, even better. She gets her nails done. Hey, I'm going to get my nails done. Okay. I see the bill. And it's not even about her nails, although they're beautiful. It's the look on her face. Beauty preparations. I try to get my head around this. One year. Six months of soaking in oil. Now, I understand there's probably some medicinal uh, qualities about that oil. And in that day, they didn't have medication like we have today. And the king was probably concerned to make sure this person that we know, we've got to take care of a few things before she becomes the queen. I get that. But six months of soaking in oil. I mean, I'm thinking, what kinds of oil? I mean, I'm sure there was probably some olive oil. I don't know if they had canola. Motor oil. Ah, 
I mean, I don't know. I don't know. And then it was six more months, six more months of soaking in fragrances. That is one smelly mess to me. (laughs) But nonetheless, beauty preparations. See, I'm a prune after I sit in a hot tub for 30 minutes. This is not good in my mind. This is, but beautiful to them, I suppose. Preparation, preparing for something. You see, preparation is a season and it needs to be considered highly. There will always be a season of preparation. And when God has something big for you to do, get ready, get resolute, and get patient. Patience is the biggest challenge of preparation, a year of preparation. And patience is the biggest challenge for preparation. Winston Churchill, he made this statement, to each there comes in their lifetime a special moment when they are figuratively tapped on the shoulder and offered the chance, offered the chance to do a very special thing, unique to them and fitted to their talents. What a tragedy if, that, if at that moment they find themselves unprepared or unqualified for, unqualified for that which could have been their finest Hour. The season you are in is likely preparing you for the next. And let me just say this to you. Don't wish it away. Don't wish it away. Don't wish it away. It will change on its own. Might be a short season. It might be a long season. Don't wish it away. In your wishing away, you will also wish away every piece of preparation that's preparing you for the next thing that God has for you. (laughs) Esther was chosen from many beautiful women who had been handpicked to be brought before the king. You know, it would be hard to imagine what thoughts actually were coursing through Esther's mind. One day, living a common life, and then the next day considered queen. And then becoming the queen of this great Persian empire, her mind was probably trying to, trying to catch up with everything that was happening to her. I don't believe in accidents. I believe that everything that happens has a purpose and a design, and I believe there's a designer God has a plan and a purpose for your life and mine. Now, I often need to help. I need help understanding the meaning, why things happen the way they do. There are so many things that I don't understand. Why things happen the way they do. Why the course of my life went the way it did. However, I have learned that most things become evident the longer a person walks in obedience. 40 years ago, Eugene Peterson wrote a great discipleship book. The title of it, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. And if you want to understand the purpose of God, if you want to know the purpose of God in your life, do the long walk of obedience. Stay the course. Do what God's asked you to do, called you to do, set you up to do. Do the long walk. It wasn't an accident, nor was it luck that caused Esther to be promoted into the powerful office of queen. When God gets ready to promote someone, he may start many years before the actual promotion occurs. As such was the case with Esther, her beauty, her cousin Mordecai that adopted her, her being in the right place at the right time. God has a plan and a design for each of our lives. He's got a plan for your life and he's got a plan for my life. It's called the providence of God. Have you heard of it? The providence. The providence. What is providence? What is providence? Here's providence is the timely preparation, the timely preparation for future eventuality. It eventually will happen. It eventually, it's good. That future, yep, it's good. God's got a design. He's got a plan. But it's going to come in his time as you prepare. On February 9th, 1709, a fire broke out 
in the home of a pastor named Samuel Wesley. It was set by people who didn't like him or his message. As the fire raged, two men walking by noticed from the second story window a young boy. They raced over to the home. One man stood on the shoulders of the other. They reached the second story window, broke through the window, and saved the six-year-old boy, brought him to safety right before the ceiling collapsed on that young boy. Samuel Wesley pastored for more than 40 years, and he saw very little fruit from his ministry. But that six-year-old son, John, sparked the greatest revival that Europe has ever seen. John Wesley. John Wesley, you might recognize one of his quotes. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can, John Wesley. You may not know Samuel Wesley, and you may not know the two men who saved him, but there is nothing less vital about them than John Wesley. Nothing less important. They played a significant role in his life. You might be sitting here today. Is my life matter? Is my life significant? Is what I'm doing? Does anybody care? And I want to say to you, yes. Yes. We know nothing of Esther's parents. They were both killed and left her orphaned. The Persian army likely killed them during a military raid, but their purpose is lived out in their daughter's bravery. There's a parent, I believe, here today wondering if you matter. If all that you have been, have been through and all that you have been, you've done is worth the struggle, and I want you to hear it, parent, the answer is yes. You are in their season of preparation. You are. You are generating. You're actually creating the season of preparation for your children. Raise your kids to know the Lord. Make sure they're in church and make church the biggest priority in their life and make sure they see the change that Christ has made in your life. That's where it starts. Esther 4, 14. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Not only is there a purpose for your life, but there is a time for your life to count, a time for your life to matter. Esther found out her, her people, the Jews, had a death sentence placed on them, and unless she went to the king and spoke on their behalf, they would all be destroyed and their property taken away by their killers. An evil man named Haman was so full of himself and angry that one man, just one man in the kingdom would not bow and recognized his superiority. That man? Uncle Mordecai. Uncle Mordecai would not bow, Esther's adopted father. Soon after Esther was elevated to the powerful position of queen, she discovered the reason for her, her good fortune. I want you to catch this. The reason for her good fortune. Esther found out that the higher the position, the higher the position, the greater the responsibility. The higher the position, the greater the responsibility. As you are in a season of preparing, you will rise to a higher level. You will. You will. Life will shift. Things will change. Positions will come. And with them, a higher level of responsibility will also come to you. But she also learned this. With a higher level of responsibility comes greater capacity. Greater capacity. People at a high level of authority and responsibility are often people that have a higher level of capacity. And with a higher level of capacity comes 
a higher level of obligation. Did you catch that? A higher level of obligation. Luke 12, 48, to whom much is given, much will be required. And Esther learned her new position was not a privilege to be enjoyed, but it was a responsibility to be stewarded. What time is it? What time? What time is it? God's people were scattered throughout the provinces of Persia. God's people have had a habit of getting scattered. We're seeing that. We're seeing that unfold before us right now. Do you think that that's what's happening in the Middle East? Scatter God's people. Scatter them out of Israel. It's been happening for thousands of years. The enemy likes to scatter God's people. It's in scattered confusion that the enemy does his best work. He struggles in unity. The enemy struggles to do his work when we are unified. When the church is unified, the enemy will struggle. He'll love it when we get scattered. He'll love it when we're fighting with each other. He'll love it when you're upset about somebody and you're just off doing your thing. He loves it. When Mordecai came to inform the queen, Queen Esther, that the king signed a decree that all the Jews were to be killed, Esther seemed to hedge a little on Mordecai's insistence to go before the king and ask for the law to be repealed. And Mordecai pressured Esther, reminding her she risked death. Whether she approached the king or not, whether she came to the king or not, she risked death. Death, Esther 4.14, for if you remind, remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish, and who knows but that you have come to a royal position for such a time as this. And God has a design. He's got a design for every person. He's got a design for you and me, but he gives us the ability to choose He's given you the ability to choose. God will use someone else if you refuse to be obedient. Choosing to make a difference when the times are difficult is no small thing. And friends, we're living in difficult times. We're living in difficult times. Recent poll, I just did some reading and research on this. A recent poll in the UK revealed that 89%, nine in 10 people ages 16 to 29, believe that their lives have no meaning or purpose. A correlating st statistic states that only 1% of this age actually identify as belonging to the church. At least half of the residents of the UK claim to be atheists. Half. And you might say, I'm glad I don't live in the UK. I'm glad you don't either, because I'm glad you're here today. But here's the problem. The United States is trending in the exact same pattern. We're trending the exact same way. The belief that life has no meaning or purpose results from the religion of evolutionary secularism that has permeated our education system and media throughout the UK and the United States. And when you adopt the religion of atheism, you also have to deal with the consequences. One of those consequences is that ultimately there is no absolute meaning or purpose to life. And that's the times we're living in. So what time is it? What time is it? Anxiety is a disorder, it disordered, it grew by 25% this year, 374 million people. It's the most common mental health concern in the United States. Loneliness is an epidemic. 80%, 80% of 18 to 20 year olds feel lonely. Isolation is dangerous. We are more connected and more isolated than we've ever been. Hopelessness and suicide, 42% of stu students, students, I said, students feel hopeless. One in 10 have actually attempted to take their life. People are doing what's right in their own eyes. In Matthew chapter five, verse 13, we've gotta get this. Matthew chapter five, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. 
You are the salt of the earth. Turn to your neighbor. Come on. Yes. You are the salt of the earth. Goes on. More. More than that. You. You are the light to the world. You. Us. Do you understand why God put this church together? I am so grateful for Pastor Henry and Alex and their obedience. Their long walk in the same direction. Make no mistake, I'm so thankful. But this church is to be a light in the darkness. You come to this church, you're part of this family, you're part of this house, you're a part of the solution. We got to embrace it, church. We got to walk into it. We got to walk. We are the light to the world. God's people throughout the Persian Empire were in a desperate situation, much like we are today. Desperate. We're the hope. Jesus is the hope. We bring the hope. Man, it's good. I love that. The role we play as a church, oh, incredible. These are incredible days, friends. Well, this story has a villain, like every good story has a villain, right? This story has a villain. His name is Haman. I call Haman Hater Haman. Hater Haman. Haman is the villain in this Cinderella story. This is the man responsible for the death sentence placed on the Jews, including the queen. He even built, Hater Haman built, he hated Mordecai so much, he built a 75-foot gallows next to his house. You talk about intimidation. Isn't that crazy? You think about the vastness of this kingdom, 127 provinces. One man... One man does not bow to him, and he builds a 75-foot gallows next to his house. What's his problem? Haman is irritated because everyone in the massive kingdom bows to him except for Mordecai, the Jew. At the time of the writing of Esther, Haman was the most powerful politician in the kingdom of Persia, second only to the king. He was a favorite to the king and had the king in his pocket. He could manipulate the king to do almost anything, including creating a law that could wipe out an entire race of people, the Jews. Everybody bowed to Haman because of his high-ranking position with the king, except one man, one man, Mordecai. He would not honor this conceited, pride-filled politician. You should not be surprised when opposition comes against you. When you're walking in the will of God and you're doing the long walk of obedience in the same direction, you should not be surprised. You should not be surprised when you're doing everything you can do. Doing your best work. And I'm telling you, the enemy, he's done it to me. He's done it to most of you probably in this room. If he hasn't done it, it get, get ready. Get ready. Get prepared. But here's the thing that will actually stop you in your tracks that the enemy would like nothing more than when the conceited, pride-filled politician that comes against you, it might be at work, might be somebody you know, it might, I don't know. The enemy uses all kinds of situations and people and they come into your life and you know what happens to us? We get angry, we get mad. We take it personal. We get offended. And unforgiveness takes a root in our spirit. And the root of bitterness takes over in our heart. And we lose sight. And we lose perspective. That God has a purpose and plan and he has you right where you are in spite of the difficult people that might come into your life. There's a reason for them. 
And I hate to say it sometimes. I hate to even think it, but it might have been that God allowed it to happen because I needed to grow up. You might be a student in this place. You might be a business owner. You might be a spouse. The devil is a sly serpent and he will try to stop you from understanding and fully embracing the why of your purpose. He'll get you off track and he'll distract you. Here's the good news. It only took one man. Mordecai only took one man, only one that would not bow. Only one said, you're going to be like that? That's how you're going to be? Nope. Mm -mm. Nope. I will not bow. I will not bow. I will not give in. Only one man, just one person pushed back the spirit of darkness. Haman hated not only Mordecai, but he hated the whole Jewish race. Haman goes to the king and he convinces him to make a decree to have all the Jews killed because of their laws. Their laws are different than ours. The Jewish laws are different than the Persians. And the king fell for it, not even realizing that he was actually about to put his own queen, Esther, a Jew, to death. In Esther's response to Mordecai, in Esther 4.16, she said this, if I perish, I perish. If that's what the call is, if I perish, I perish. And there comes a time in all of our lives when we have to make a decision as to where we stand. You have to make a decision. It may be on the job. It may be at your school. It may be in your marriage. or maybe even the most important relationships you have, but you have to make a decision one day of where you stand. Joshua 24, 14. Choose this day who you will serve. (sighs) But for me and my house, but for me and my house, can you say that today? But for me and my house, no choice. I'm serving God. I'm serving God. Mordecai reminded Esther of who she is. A Jew. You're a Jew. Now that she was queen, she was responsible for using her position for people. He told Esther if she refused to use her power to help, God would use somebody else, but she and her family would be destroyed anyway. I could die. Yep. I could die. If I go before the king uninvited, I could die. I haven't been before the king in 30 days. He hasn't invited me into his throne room in 30 days. What did she do? She brings all of her friends together and they have a three-day prayer meeting. You're facing a tough situation. You're facing overwhelming circumstances. Get on your face. Bring your friends around you. Get to the Wednesday night prayer meeting. Pray. Pray, pray. When Esther went before the king, he invited her into his throne room. He didn't have her killed, but he gave her everything she wanted. And I want to remind you, God can work on both ends of situations. He's not only working on your behalf. He's not just working on your behalf. He's also working on the behalf of the person that you thought was completely conceited and full of himself and arrogant. That's an interesting thought. How could God work on behalf of people that don't even know him? Because he's in charge. (laughs) So what happened to Haman? Well, the king had Haman hung on the gallows that he had built for Mordecai in Esther 710. So they hanged Haman, Haman on the gallows he had prepared for Mordecai, and the king's fury subsided. And on the night before the king discovered Haman's plot, the king had trouble sleeping and he began reading the public recordings of the kingdom. There's some night reading for you. All the public, he starts going through the public records. He read about the time when Mordecai had saved his life by revealing a plot to kill him. So the king decided to reward Mordecai. And Haman's plot was discovered by the king and the king had Haman killed on the gallows that he had built for Mordecai. 
And you might be in the most challenging situation of your life. You want to quit. You want to give up. You want to run away. You've ever felt that way? I just want to run away. The people around you perhaps lack character. You've lost trust. And this is where patience comes in. This is where long suffering takes over. This is where grit, this is where, what are you made of? This is where grit is actually developed in your life. To be able to do hard things, to be able to stick with it and do the long walk of obedience in the same direction. This is where you say, God, you be the judge. I am not. I don't get it. You be the judge. This is beyond me. So God's question to us, God's question to me, God's question to you, do you know why I gave you the life that you have at such a time as this? Do you know why you were born? You all were, obviously. Greatest day of your life. But do you know why? There's millions of people on this planet. Millions of people on this planet. And there is a why just for you. A why just for you. There's a purpose just for you. Will you walk in it? Will you embrace it? Will you embrace the call of God that he has on your life? I want you to just bow your heads with me for a second. I want to do two things as we get ready to close. The first is I want to give you an opportunity to commit your life to Jesus. And this is maybe a little bit different than we usually do, but I want to ask you this question. If you would like to, or you have already, if you would like to maybe for the first time, or you have already committed your life to Christ, and today you want to just make that statement, either for the first time or over again, you want to make that statement one more time today, I'd like to invite you to stand to your feet. First time, 100% committed your life to Christ, or do it over again even today. I'd like to invite you to stand to your feet. Come on. If you'd like to commit your life, recommit, I'm not sure if I'm making myself clear. If you would like to recommit your life to Christ today, I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet. Come on, there we go. There we go, all over this room. Commit your life to Christ. I'd like you to just invite you to stand to your feet. I think I'm missing that somewhere. There should be just about every person in this room standing to your feet right now. I want to pray a prayer of recommitment across this house today. Come on, every person. You would like, you have, or you'd like to do it again. Or maybe it's the first time I'm committing my life to follow Jesus today. That's the statement. There we go. There we go. I don't think I quite made that clear. Come on, all across this room. All across this room. I want to just pray a prayer in this house today. I want to pray a prayer in this house today of, of commit full on. Friends, full on. Full on commitment. This is where the plan of God starts. 
This is where the purpose of your life begins, that you are actually in Christ, in him. And I want you to just repeat this prayer. Come on, across this room with me. Dear Jesus, come on, say it out loud. Jesus, I choose again today to follow hard after you. I commit my life to you, to serve you, to walk with you, to know you, to know your word. I commit myself to you today. I embrace the purpose that you have for my life today. I accept it all in, no looking back. No matter what challenge comes my way, I am focused. I believe it. I am steadfast. I am secure. I am looking forward to how you will use my life from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Come on, cross this room. The last thing I'm going to do just before we go, I want to invite our prayer team to come down to the front because I really believe there's some of you that are, you, you really do, you're struggling. You're struggling. You've just prayed that prayer. That's where it starts, friends. You just prayed the prayer. You just prayed the prayer. I'm in. God, I'm serving you 100%, 100%, 100%, but you still in your heart of hearts, it's like... Do I really know why? I know I was born, but do I really know why? I'm just going to invite you as we close this time together. Just step out of your seat. Come. These people want to pray with you, want to lay hands upon you, want to pray a blessing over your life, want to pray the anointing of God upon you. Some of you are facing some overwhelming circumstances and situations. I actually felt in my spirit, even as I was just speaking, there are individuals in this room, you've had thoughts of taking your own life. I want to tell you that is the lie from the pit of hell. Your life has meaning. Your life has purpose. You've got things to do. Get those thoughts. Get behind me. Satan, get behind me. Get those thoughts out of your life.